Now, this first time I've uh, preached in November at a Christmas candlelight service, so <clears throat> it's a real pressure, I mean pleasure to be with you this morning. I haven't been up here on the shelf for a long time addressing a Twain Heart Church. In fact, we were in the other building before, and uh, that other building that you remember was actually a lot larger than uh, the building that I came to preach in in <clears throat> December 1977. That was my first sermon. Whew, a long time ago, maybe 25 years, I don't know. And um, <laughs> Noel asked me a couple of weeks ago, you know, <clears throat> if I'd be available uh, to preach this morning, and <clears throat> I told him I was, and I said, what should I preach about? And he says, about 45 minutes, so uh, we got an extra hour, though, last night. I was wondering, you know, if that kind of translates to uh, an extra hour from the pulpit this morning. Well, <clears throat> I promise you, you'll be out be before uh, second half of the uh, Cardinals and 49ers game, though, this afternoon. Um, This, uh, I, the Lord has led us over a long period of 40 years and more uh, to be active in His service and in church work. I served in 13 different churches, and um, there were four of those churches, including, you know, this church before we came here because you didn't have a pastor back then. Uh, where uh, they were going through that transition. And it was, um, it was upsetting because, you know, people either liked their pastor or maybe the pastor had been there a long, long time. Um, and I remember, you know, when we came back here in this area in 2006, there was a and all these were our denominational churches. They were all evangelical free churches. And um, the church up in Hamilton City had their pastor uh, who had been there for a long time. He just moved to another area, and it was time for him to go. The Lord called him to a different place, so the transition was quite easy. And then uh, I served in a large church down in the Bay Area, and... Uh, the pastor had founded the church, but all of a sudden, uh, the culture of the church had changed so that um, the pastor, who basically was raised in a rural area, farm area, and, and so forth, found himself in a church that had really grown, but uh, the whole constituency had changed. It had changed in the sense that there were executives, you'd look out in the parking lot, there were BMWs and, and Porsches and maybe a Lamborghini or two, and the people had grown spiritually, a lot of young families and so forth, and the culture had changed so much that it was just not a, a conducive uh, to the pastor anymore. So the district superintendent met, met with him and said, you know, maybe it's time to move on, and he did. He resigned and went to a different church. So I was on staff at the time, and I got to see, you know, what was happening within the church uh, during that transition period. And, and then another church uh, that I was in <clears throat> back in the Midwest before I came here, I was called to, and I loved the pastor. He was so relational. He led his, his uh, neighbors to the Lord Jesus, and he was a, a scholar. He, he was a doctorate from Columbia University in New York. His dad actually uh, was one of my professors in seminary. Uh, he was recruited by the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful person. But the, in the congregation, there arose people who were very wealthy. They owned a number of people within the church, and uh, they began... Uh, to have conflict with the pastor and tried to manipulate him and so forth. He ended up having to resign early, and then he ended up in the hospital because of the pressure 
uh, with knots in his back. I received a phone call here a few years ago, and it just said that basically uh, the people that were, that were really causing trouble uh, died early. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, but um, the, other, the other part of it was that that church was, which had uh, ended up, when I first went there as <clears throat> an associate, um, it went from 1,200 to 1,300 the first year to 1,400 the next year. And in the third year, it was split into three. And it was more like a war zone than it was a body of Christ. But when I received that phone call, it said, the church has come back together, it has grown, it is making significant strides within the community. And I thought, you know, it's the Lord Jesus who is the head of the church. And that's what I say uh, to this wonderful group here. You may be on the verge right now of a, uh, of a new man coming in. And believe me, as we are speaking here, the Lord is preparing a person for this congregation. And it's not going to make an awful lot of difference after a while. He's going to be, you know, the honeymoon will, will wear off after a while. You'll get used to him, and uh, he'll get used to you, and you'll see what the chemistry is like. But he's going to be doing exactly what I'm doing here this morning, sharing with you how God wants to change the church and establish it in this community as a witness for him. He's the head of the church. He's on the throne. And I tell you, friends, uh, this church is going to succeed. You will find indescribable future for the church if you'll keep your eyes peeled upon our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know why I'm getting cotton mouth up here. I'm not really nervous. It's just... It's dry, I guess. <clears throat> you know, I really don't know where you are. I would, I know some of you, some of you, you know, were my board leaders and have two of the very fine women in this church who were secretaries. I have uh, people in the church whose parents taught our kids back then and as they were growing up. And I can say of the 13 churches that uh, the Lord had allowed me to be in, that uh, Bonnie and I consider this church the special one, maybe the most special. We, we have friends that are scattered also throughout the community in different locations. And it's just like when we would come back to visit, it was, we would just pick up where we... Uh, where we were before, and we have some of the dearest friends, even the best friends that we've ever had, that are right here. And uh, we love this church. I have an attachment to this church and an investment in it, and we pray for you every single day. And we know that God has a great future for you. But I don't know where you are today. It could be, and it would be wonderful if you could say to me, Pastor Dave, uh, I am so excited about the Lord. He has been blessing our home. Our home is a safe place. We have good relationships with one another. Uh, our marriage is solid. We're just uh, working uh, together. And I, I anticipate uh, every time I open the word that God is going to speak to me and he's going to help me to change the things that are rough and uh, those edges that need to be smoothed out. And things are just going so grand for me. I just cannot wait to hear from the Lord week to week as I go to church. I would hope that would be your case. And maybe it is. <clears throat> but it could be that some of you are saying, well, I wish it were like that. But I'm going through some bumpy uh, experiences in my life. And, I, and my confidence is low. And it could be that uh, there are relationships that are strained within the family or maybe within people, uh, among people in the church or something that's bothering you. And you, you, you say, I, I have a, a difficulty and I, I don't know how to overcome it. Can you give me some advice? And I know we're all worried about uh, our, the political situation that's such 
a mess in our country and the hatred and the prejudice and, and the decisions that are made. There seems to be so much corruption that's there and, and we're worried about the future and we say, when is COVID going to end? My doctor uh, told me that, you know, the Spanish plague lasted three years. You know, it may not be over for a while. We don't know. And we're looking at to our future and we say, will every, anything ever be, ever be normal again? And I think most of us are thinking, no, it's never going to be because you can't put your foot back in the same stream. But we have to know today, Lord, that, you know, if you, if you ask me, can you give me advice on these things? I, and I could give you my opinion, but I can't solve those kind of things for you. Really can't. In fact, there's only one thing that I know. I know that Jesus loves you, and he loves me. And you say, well, how much does he love you? How much does he love me? Let me tell you how much he loves you and me. He loves us this much. That much. And I know that if I were the only person, I'm very humbled to think, if I were the only person that was a sinner, that Jesus would have come and died on the cross for me and you. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, the Bible tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the only way that we could ever get things right with God is not any effort on our part. No matter how many times you go to church or whatever you do, it's really not going to happen. It had to be God taking the initiative and sending his own son in our place shed his blood for our sins and when we remit our sins to him and accept him as our Lord and Savior then we know the great love of God and how it really transpires within our lives I'd like to share with you something that was so exciting to me it really made chills go up and down my spine um, I felt like the bells of heaven were reverberating in my head. And you say, well, what in the world did you do? I went to YouTube. <laughs> and I say, yeah, anybody can get on YouTube. I, I'm even on YouTube. And I've got, uh, you know, friends, even from here in this, uh, that were part of this church or whatever, my former youth pastor, he's playing guitar on YouTube. You can get on YouTube. But I was looking up a man who had preached a sermon at Wingate College in uh, Bristol, Tennessee, Virginia uh, when I was 14 years of age at a Youth for Christ convention. And uh, this man was named Bill Aiken. I looked him up, and lo and behold, I found him. And they had a clip of him as an old man. And this was three or four years ago uh, that they... Uh, put this on YouTube, but here was Bill Aiken after he was giving an interview and he was telling about the 60 years that he was blessed to work with young people. And they even did some clips of him, this old dude with uh, a, ma uh, a mass of teenagers around him. And I imagine he's in heaven right now. But he spoke on the same passage that I'd like to um, go uh, into the scripture with you today. And I was standing with a, a group of young people after he had spoken on this passage. And the Lord had convicted me step by step as every point that he had made uh, from the scripture. And I realized that I needed to rededicate my life to the Lord. I became a Christian when I was six years old. I've known the Lord for 70 years. And at 14 years of age, I came to the place where I turned my life over anew unto the Lord. And I look back 
as that was the time where the Lord was calling me into full-time ministry. This is not a, an unfamiliar passage. Uh, Romans chapter 12. I know you can quote verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him uh, which, were, which is his reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now let me read through um, chapter, chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. And I'm using New American Standard Version. We will uh, deal with the personal conditioning today, and next week we will do with the corporate conditioning. What the church, this Twain Heart Bible Church, needs to do in order to do the will of God. <clears throat> Verse 3 begins For through the grace given, given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. <clears throat> if it's prophecy, according to proportion of his faith. If it's service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So, <clears throat> when he says, therefore, it obviously refers back to something that had happened previously and what he had recorded, what the Apostle Paul had recorded uh, from chapters 1 on. Chapters 1 through 7 uh, deal with the subject of justification, and chapters 8 through 11 uh, talk about sanctification and justification is basically how God planned and enacted salvation for you and me uh, through Jesus Christ and the reason was if you go to the first chapter of, of Romans you find the awfulness of man's sin and uh, the hatred that God has against any sin all sin, and <clears throat> chapters uh, 2 and 3 uh, say there aren't any exemptions. Every one of us is included, including babies who are born with a sin nature. And you say, well, it doesn't seem fair that, that God would disregard them, and I don't believe that he does. In fact, we're talking about, you know, in, in uh, chapter 12, verse 1, uh, based on the mercies of God. God has had mercy I believe that uh, for those who are unable to ex exercise their free will and make the choice to accept uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they will be included uh, because God is fair and he is very merciful. An example that helps me uh, to verify that is in the Old Testament where King David <clears throat> had an affair with Bathsheba they had a child, and the child died. And David, it was told that, that the baby could not come to David, but King David would someday go to the baby. And I believe that that is the place where our God is in heaven. And I believe if you know, we don't have the, the freedom to exercise that free will, then the Lord... Uh, is very fair and will have mercy. But for all of us, all have sinned, every single one of us. In fact, chapter 3 says there's none that does good, not even one, no, none righteous, no, not one. And you know 
Uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, uh, chapter 6 and verse 23, it tells us about the end result of sin. The wages of sin is death. But it talks about the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So and it's an exchange. For our unrighteousness, God had to provide his righteousness. And the only way he could do that was through the righteous person of his son. So he sent Jesus from heaven, who was God, to become one of us, to identify with us, to go through every temptation, through every, uh, every pressure, every exertion upon our lives so that he was not only God, but he was fully human. Now, you say in his humanity, um, it seemed like that he would know everything, that he would have, you know, the full measure of his power. But Philippians chapter 2 tells us that though he was God, he, he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God, but he humbled himself and he became one of us. And he, he be, was found in the fashion of man so that he could go to the cross and die for us. And Luke chapter 2, verse 52 talks about his humanity and how that he had to grow. He had to grow in four areas. The Bible tells us that he grew, I don't know whether you can see your Bible, I can hardly see mine, but he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. In other words, he, he grew in four areas. He grew in wisdom, and that means that he grew mentally. He grew in stature, that means that he grew physically. He grew in favor with man. He grew socially. And he grew in favor with God. He grew spiritually. And so when Paul is addressing us in chapter uh, 12 of Romans, verses 1 and 2, those same four areas need to be conditioned. So he says, first of all, the physical he says, I beseech you, brothers, on the mercies of God, on the basis of justification by faith. Chapter 8 talks about sanctification. And you say, what's that? That's really the, the working of the Holy Spirit upon our lives to refine us. And, uh, and chapter um, 8, verse 1 says, There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who have been justified, those who are in Christ who walk not according to the flesh, which is our humanity. And uh, we'll talk about the kind of humanity that he was, does not want us uh, to follow. And um, it, <clears throat> he is basically saying that we walk not according to the evil that is in our human world, but that we walk by the Spirit. And so the Spirit refines us, it instructs us, it guides us, it empowers us, and when we are conditioned by the Holy Spirit, then that's called sanctification. So on the basis of justification and sanctification, now we have how to do it. This is all the practical stuff that goes from chapter 12 through 16, and um, he says, present your bodies, first of all, as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Now that seems uh, like an oxymoron, doesn't it? You're dead, but you're alive. In the Old Testament, when you had sacrifices, there were three things that had to occur at least. First of all, if it was an animal or if it was a bird, then it had to be, it had to die. Uh, you had a beast or a fowl, they had to shed their blood and uh, they had to die. And you can see how that carries over. There are things for which uh, we cannot uh, embrace, and we have to put them to death. There has to be a funeral for some activities and some attitudes and some things within our heart that have to be killed. But secondly, the, the uh, sacrifice had to be clean and I would take you back, I'm not going to be able to because I can't read very well from up here, but I would take you back to 
the 11th chapter of, Le of uh, Leviticus, and it tells all kinds of different animals that are unclean, that uh, the, the people of Israel were not to eat at all. One was the camel, <laughs> but another was a rabbit, and another was a pig, and even, you know, carried over to, uh, to uh, aqua life, so you couldn't eat any uh, fish uh, that didn't have scales. So that would, you know, oust catfish for us. Some people like eels, but it even goes over to insects. And um, you say, well, I'm not really into that. But there's a whole list of insects that uh, I'm, I'm with God on that one, that uh, I wouldn't really want to put that on my menu anyway. But it talks then about lizards and geckos and, you know, thing that reptiles that, uh, well, I can leave that off, you know, uh, the menu also. But then it talks about certain kinds of birds that you couldn't eat. You couldn't eat a uh, hawk or, uh, in, you know, an eagle or any of those. They had, had to be clean animals. And God listed those animals that were clean uh, that could be eaten and the ones that weren't uh, clean then they were forbidden but it even goes uh, you know to uh, insects and all kinds of things in other words in other words the cleanliness there had to be you had to be dead sacrifice there had to be a cleanliness and that's what the Lord is transferring in this lesson that we're talking about today we have to have a clean heart, and that's purified by the Holy Spirit of God to keep us clean. But it also talks about the clean mind, and uh, we'll get into that in, in the other conditionings here. But you see, the third one was that you couldn't offer uh, a sacrifice that had any kind of defect. It had to be the best. Now, this is something that we probably don't... don't want to admit to or embrace in our culture but back then the firstborn was given special privileges the firstborn son was considered the best of all the children now i'm sure that make everybody else jealous but uh, it's just kind of crazy that way here you have a situation where god gave his very best. He gave his firstborn. You will find in the book of Hebrews and the book of a, a clean church, a, a church that is a firstborn. You find in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 5, that our Lord Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. But it was the best. There couldn't be any defect whatsoever. And so what the Lord is telling us when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable unto God, the only way it can be is that we will die for which the same things that Jesus died for us to forgive us. And also, uh, we have to be clean before him. And so, I know that's talking a lot about, you know, the things that, uh, that enter our mind. Some, uh, it's, it's everything, swearing and and it's uh, <clears throat> when we have lustful thoughts or uh, when we engage in practices uh, that are where we lose our temper or, or we have uh, um, some kind of regret against someone and we hold, hold grudges and there's bitterness and all this, this has to be purified. And the only way it can be purified is a submission. It's the same thing when you became a Christian. You said, I submit my sins to the Lord. Well, on a daily basis, you have to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit who resides in us. Now, the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> as we mentioned in chapter 8, is a person. It's not a force. In fact, uh, in Acts chapter 5, you have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And uh, these two early church members... Um, sold a piece of property, and they came to the, to the church, and they said, 
here, we're giving this all to you, all the proceeds. And actually, they were holding back for themselves uh, part of it, which was a substantial uh, part, and they had lied. But Peter says, you haven't lied just to us. You have lied to the Holy Spirit. You can't lie to a force. You have to lie to a person. And then a few verses later, it's going to say, you have lied to God. So God and the Holy Spirit are the same. And he is the one who is doing the refining process. He helps us to do a funeral service for those, oh, those habits, those things that really distract from the love of God. The Bible tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. And you say, you mean if I sin, God doesn't love me anymore? And that's not what it means. It means that the access to the love of God, which makes your life flourish spiritually, is hindered when we concentrate our efforts on the world. So the next two, we're going we're gonna to combine these together. And, uh, you know, you say, well, tell me about Jesus. Tell me about uh, how he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He was such an interesting young man. In fact, the parents knew in advance the kind of person that uh, this boy would be. I bet you would like to have a boy like this. Never sassed his mom. He never, uh, he never grumbled to his dad when the dad said, you rake the leaves. He said, okay, I'll do it. And he had brothers and sisters, and brothers and sisters didn't like him. And um, I can just see him out playing hoops and and maybe one of uh, his uh, brothers or maybe an ornery kid in the neighborhood just for no reason at all just got ticked off and, and smacked him up the side of the head. And instead of uh, reacting, um, he said, hey, 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 it's okay. I forgive you. In fact, if you're that angry, why don't you just go ahead and haul off and hit me on the other side too. You know, that was Jesus. Well, the family um, got confused, even the mother and dad. Uh, they took a vacation. They went from the highlands up there in Nazareth, and they went down to the big city in Jerusalem. And they traveled with, uh, with a whole group of family members. All the aunts and the uncles and the cousins were together in a caravan. We might call it a camel pool or a donkey pool. I don't know what it was. But they went down to the big city. They had a great time down there. It was time to go back. And so here they were in a caravan, and, and uh, they assumed that, you know, they, all the relatives, they just kind of hang out. Everybody stayed in a group. But a couple days after they had traveled, as they were going back north, then the parents uh, said, hey, uh, wh where's our oldest? We, have, we haven't seen him around. Oh, he's probably with a cousin. So they checked out with a cousin. Cousin, we haven't, we haven't seen him. We haven't seen him since we got here. And so the parents said, oh, no, there's, there's something missing here. We've got to go back. So they went to the city, scoured it, and they found him. And guess where they found him? Of all places, in church. <laughs> and I can kind of see him. You know, he's up for the pastor usually is, except he was probably just sitting here, you know, on the ledge, and, and you had a group of chairs around. There was the pastor and his staff that were there, and uh, maybe a couple of bigwigs from the denomination happened to be visiting, and then you had the whole church board on the other side, and this kid was up there teaching them about the scripture that they should have known, and he was elaborating on it, and it was fascinating well, the parents came in uh, from the back, and pastor probably stood up and said, hey, come on, come on up. You must be the most fantastic parents in the world. You have a prodigy here. This kid, 12 years old, he is telling us things in the Old Test, in the Bible that we don't even know, and a couple of us here have our doctor's degree. And so the parents weren't all that happy, even though they said, thank you, thank you, and they said, 
you come with me. And they went outside with their boy, and their boy was there, and uh, they said, the mom speaks up. She says, we've been worried to death. You know how upset we are? We've looked all over the place for you. We're just sick. And, and what were you doing? And Jesus, whose name is Jehovah, is salvation. And the parents knew that because an angel had appeared to them and saying that your son is going to be called God with us. He's going to be called Jehovah is salvation. And so their son, Jesus, looked up and said to the parents, he said, didn't you know that I was supposed to be about my father's business? And they did. And actually, the dad there was not the biological father because the mother was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was fully God, and he was fully us. He was fully human. And he understands what that sacrifice is in our humanity. He's to stay away from things that are wrong, to embrace the things of God the Father. He spent time with his Father all the time on his knees. He would just go away from the crowd and pray every single day. And that's what the Lord is telling us to do with your bodies. Spend time with the Lord. But do not be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you might prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now I don't have a lot of time today. But we could go back into where we are in our culture. There are four aspects of our culture that we need to be aware of. The first is humanism. Humanism is basically saying that man doesn't need God in order to uh, operate. He basically depends on himself, his own mind, his own feelings. You can go back to the 19th century in the Age of Enlightenment. And before that time, uh, before the late eight. 1881, or about that, which was called the Age of Reasoning or Age, Age of Enlightenment, people did believe, most people, 90% of the people, even though they might have not been religious, they, they believed that there was something out there beyond just physical man, that some influence, some, and they were afraid of these spirits or these unknown forces or whatever. It wasn't, you know, our Judeo Christian God, but at least they recognized that there was something beyond our humanity. But from the age of the Enlightenment, the age of reasoning on, up until the present day, people do not adhere to anything that is supernatural, anything that's transcendent, and they reject God. And it's gotten to the point where not only do they reject God, they're anti-God. They're saying there isn't any God at all. That's humanism. Secularism means that society can set its own standards, and it does, but it's without the influence of any religion or whatever. And then you have relativism. Relativism just basically says that there is no truth. You make up your own truth. Whatever your opinion is, that's truth. And some people are saying there's no truth at all. You know what that is? That's a purposeless existence. Where is it going to end? It's going to end in despair. Everyone that doesn't have his eyes on God looking upward is looking downward. And that's where it's going to go. And that's what Paul is saying here. Don't be conformed to the ideologies and uh, the movement, movements out there that are anti-God. And then there is a fourth area and this is called the New Atheism. The New Atheism is organized. They're actually meeting like we are. And I don't know what they're talking about. I can't imagine. You know, they have all these blessings and they don't have anybody to thank. It's really crazy. But it's also telling us that uh, we 
are up against a whole system of or a worldview that is anti-God. And the new atheists not only want to do away with Christianity, they want to do away with Christians. Bonnie, my dear wife, just uh, she does an awful lot of research, and she said that there are 50 churches in Canada that have been burned to the ground. She also told me, she says that, you know, while Americans have been trying to get out of Afghanistan, that there is a mass um, annihilation of Christians. And I haven't heard that on any major news network at all. These are the kinds of things that we have to uh, avoid. I know there, there's all these other kinds of issues, all e and evils, you know, the grudges and the prejudice and, and the hatred and all of that sort of thing. And those do not belong to God. We have to reject those. But the Bible tells us that our mind has to be renewed. It, just like the sacrifice, it has to be cleansed. It has to have a daily cleansing so that we have not the worries of this world, not whether COVID is going to end right now or sometime. It's not really going to be, you know, whether or not your, uh, your pastor comes here soon or anything like that. It is, what is God speaking to you today that you need to change? What is it that needs to be reconditioned? The mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And if I could actually see, this is a, a very important passage in chapter 8 of Romans. Listen to this. From chapter, from verse 6 on, it says, For the mind, for the mind that's set on the flesh is death. But the mind that's set on the spirit is life and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you're not in the flesh but in the spirit. And if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, and in, indeed if the spirit of God dwells in you, but if... Anyone does not have the spirit of Christ. He does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead to sin, yet the spirit is alive because of the righteousness. And that's the righteousness of Christ. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Isn't that happy news? My friends, let's just bow for prayer. How about that? We titled the sermon, Change Means Change. And God is speaking to us and he's saying, there's something that needs to be altered, something that's modified that would conform more to the will of God. And you can just... Take inventory right now and say, is there an attitude of criticism? Am I just lethargic? I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do anything for the Lord. I don't even care about my neighbor. The Lord wants us to love our neighbors, reach out to them and help them where we can and introduce them to Jesus. Is there someone in your family that where you need repair? What is it that the Lord wants to change? Just think about it. And as you do that, you will be more conditioned to be acceptable to the perfect will of God. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have been able to explore a part of your word today. I pray that you'll hide the self-life of the person who's behind this sacred desk. I pray that Jesus Christ might be elevated. I pray that each of us will do an inventory and, and say, Lord, 
what is it that I need to change that I might be more prepared to do your work. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit is, is speaking to us. We thank you that Jesus Christ has died for us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are monitoring all of our life and you'll never leave us nor ever forsake us. And we pray these things in the precious, holy name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.